Do the steps or die, motherfucker. That's it. That's that's the work, man. It's recovery's not easy. If you think recovery is easy, then somebody's not telling you the truth. It's not easy. And but that's where it's at, man. That's where I've learned so much about myself and about how I treat others when I'm not treating myself the way I should and the way I deserve. That was Daniel Heron, and this is the Share Podcast. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Share Podcast. And today, we have Daniel Heron joining us on the show, where we discuss addiction to the criminal element, addiction in general, prison life, recovery, and advocacy. It's an all-in-one episode you do not want to miss. And before we dive into Daniel's episode, I'm excited to announce that we have officially launched ShareSpace, the empowerment network. And what ShareSpace is, is a personal development life coaching community where happiness, fulfillment, and purpose equal success. ShareSpace is a live, in-person, online coaching session every week with me and all the other ShareSpace members. So each week, what you will get is in-person coaching with me, weekly live online meetings with myself and the other members. And in those meetings, what we will be focusing on is what is holding you back, removing self-doubt, crushing your fears, establishing positive habits, identifying your superpowers, what sets you apart from the rest, and developing a whole new belief system about yourself and the world around you. If you are listening to this right now and you are not happy, fulfilled, or inspired to live in your purpose, then ShareSpace is the right place for you. At $37 a month, it's the best personal development platform available on the internet. So for more information about ShareSpace, go to www.thesharepodcast.com and on the top right corner, click on the ShareSpace button or on the right-hand side of the website is a banner that says ShareSpace. Click on that banner, and it will take you directly to the website. ShareSpace. It's time to believe in yourself again. And for those of you that are looking for the perfect recovery gift to give to yourself or to a friend in recovery, then go to www.allrecoveryrings.com. At All Recovery Rings, you can have any recovery medallion beautifully transformed into a ring you can wear on your finger. All you need to do is select the medallion of your choice, submit your ring size, and All Recovery Rings will create the perfect ring for you. So go to www.allrecoveryrings.com and order your recovery ring today. And for those of you who love listening to the Share Podcast and want to enhance your recovery, then join us in our Share Facebook private group, the Share Recovery Network. In this free Facebook private group, you will meet thousands of people in recovery that are loving, caring, and being of service. If you're struggling in your recovery or you're struggling in life, then this might be the perfect place for you. The purpose of the Share Recovery Network is to discuss recovery in all of its facets and all of its pathways in a way that is attractive and all-inclusive. So to join us in this Facebook private group, go to Facebook, go to the search bar, type in S-H-A-I-R, Recovery Network, and our private Facebook group will pop right up. So join us today. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. It's one of the best ways to show your support for the podcast. Now a quick message from Transitions Daily and then on to the show. Would you like to join a free, anonymous online group that offers a daily topic email with popular recovery resources accompanied by a secret Facebook group for discussion? Then go to dailyaaemails.com for more information about Transitions Daily. And don't forget to share dailyaaemails.com with friends, in meetings, and with sponsees in recovery. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Hey, oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show, buddy. How are you feeling? Oh, I feel fantastic, man. Excellent. Feeling great. All right. Let's do this. So first of all, so folks, today we have Daniel Heron joining us on the Share Podcast. And Daniel reached out to me after listening to my interviews on the Dopey Podcast and Church and Other Drugs interview. Uh, he has his own podcast. It's called Released into Captivity, Hope After the Cage. Daniel served 10 years on a 12-year prison term in California for armed robbery and was sober for nine of those years. 
except for the four joints he smoked because he didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> then he was re- all right. <laughs> then he was released in 2010. <laughs> he was, uh, uh, and he always had resentments for the 12 step fellowship, but after a really bad run that did not quit and led to another prison term, he released, he received the gift of desperation again. So now he goes to meetings, has a sponsor, works the steps, work the steps or die motherfucker. Right? Yeah, that's right, man. I remember one of the first meetings I was ever in and uh, a girl that I actually went to high school with said, do the steps or die motherfucker. <laughs> And, and it was, was a girl. Like, yeah, yeah. She's an awesome lady, man. I was like, wow, all right, I better do them steps. And just to correct you, I did not get a second prison term. You didn't. I, en- I ended up in handcuffs, but I the, the police let me go. So that's just a little minor correction, yeah. All right, well, when we get into your story, I want you to elaborate on that and what happened. Uh, obviously, obviously, you know. Obviously, obviously, yeah. <laughs> All right, so before we dive into your story, though, uh, first tell us, Daniel, what does your normal daily routine look like, including recovery, and what stuff do you got going on right now? So for me, in the morning when I wake up, and, and I've heard this from a lot of your guests on this program, before my feet hit the ground, I, tr- I try to start with that attitude of gratitude. I uh, I I give thanks. I try to think of as many things as I can to be thankful for, but for the grace of God, I thank for the, I thank him for the grace of God, for having a roof over my head, for not having to take a shit in the morning next to five other dudes, you know, uh, right. To not, to not have to take a shower with six other dudes. So there's plenty of things in my life that I have to be thankful for. So that's the first thing I try to do is I try to be thankful I try to enter into a time of Thanksgiving and then I, I, I normally, for me, I pick up my Bible and I read Proverbs. So I read a Proverbs every day and I read the just for today. And so I do a little a t- a little quiet time of devotion and then I go, I, I go right in. Normally I take a leak after that. So unless I have to pee really bad, I, 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 I give thanks. I do a little devotion time and then I try to go right into a time of prayer and meditation where I, I do some praying and then I use an app that I have on my phone called Calm. Nice. And I, I try to do at least 10 minutes every day of just mindfulness. And for somebody like me who has, who though the monkey's off my back, the circus <laughs> is still in town, right? So, <laughs> and so that circus can get going pretty quickly, you know, and I try to just, you know, like they say in AA, stay on the beam and... Because I, I, I do N.A., so I'm an N.A. guy, but, you know, A, 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 N, A, C, A, whatever keeps me from the D.A. Is, o- is okay, right? I couldn't agree more. Right. So that's pretty much my daily routine. And then um, I've been self-employed since I paroled from prison. So normally, uh, you know, I get up, I take a shower, I get to work. I, 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 I've just started my exercise program again, so... I, and I and because I'm such a raging, grimy addict, and I'm obsessive and compulsive about everything I do, you know. In the past, I've worked out like to a fault, and so now I've sort of just I've I've I've, ta- I've tapered it off to just doing push-ups and doing 30 minutes of cardio, and then after that, I, t- I typically go on with my day, whatever I have in store, which uh, which up to this point has been sort of wide open, being self-employed, and I do uh, audio video programming, so my days are pretty wide open and I do a lot of advocacy work for criminal justice reform. So hit a lot of meetings, man. I, you know, I'm still, I'm still one, I'm still on a meeting a day, you know, uh, still a meeting a day and I'll get into, I'll get into my meeting schedule when we, when we get going farther. Cause, uh, I took a suggestion from an old timer after I had a little relapse relapse on, on weed, go figure. (laughs) <laughs> Shocking, right? Shocking. It's not really yeah. a drug. No, man. It's, it's not, natural, I mean, man. They grow it, man. And 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 I, and I, you know, I, and it has a lot of very positive qualities for sick people. That, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, that's one side of it. But for for this app, for an addict like me, no mood changing, mind altering substances. I mean, I'm still struggling with nicotine. You know, like. <laughs> So I don't smoke, I vape, but now I've, I'm an addict. So you can yes. imagine how much vape smoke I blow in a oh. day. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I have watched that transition morph. Oh. It's like every oh addict that used to smoke now vapes. 
It is unbelievable. It does smell right? delicious, though. I will tell you that. Oh, the one I have right now is so good. It's like glazed donuts in Miss Samoa. <laughs> it tastes so, so good. It's so, just ridiculous. Real quick, before we dive any further, though, I'm curious. Uh, self-employed, what does that look like? Oh, it's a pain in the ass sometimes. What is it? I, so, what, so what I do is I program audio video equipment. Mm. So like – like the job that we'll get into that I'm, I'm probably going to take up here in Northern California, they do a lot of institutional organizations. So classrooms where they have like media equipment. So uh, so you can plug in your laptop or wirelessly connect and, 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 and they stream it to a screen or, you know, they have video conferencing in, in a lot of corporate offices. And so I, I, design the graphic user interfaces and then program the hardware so that when you push the buttons on the interface it actually works so that's that's wow. what i and i got into it oh my by the grace of god my dad and my brother both into this business and after i was out of prison for two years my brother just called me one day and was like hey bro like i don't have time to do this like can i can i teach you how to do it and I'm like, well, how much do they make? And he told me, and I was like, I'm getting in my car right now. I'll be right there. Really? You know, yeah, because I mean, you know, five years out of prison, I made I made 119 grand five years out of prison. Doing this? So, doing doing this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so w w you and I were talking right after this interview. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you up on I'm game. Doing I'll this put you up shit on game. all day long. You know what I mean? HB the... baby, yeah. HB baby. Look a brother up. <laughs> I'm ready yeah. to make a hundred grand. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, man. Hey, well, just just as a caveat, when you know, when you're a grimy addict like me, I didn't pay my taxes that year, so I still got to clean that wreckage up. But <laughs> uh, thank God I live in Costa Rica. Oh God, nod, nod, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> I work abroad. Uh, all right, yeah, all right. Uh -huh. oh, oh man. Shit. Okay, we'll talk about oh. that later. All right, so we've already discussed what your normal daily routine looks like. I normally ask what <clears throat> um what your morning your your daily maintenance for your for maintaining your spiritual condition, but we've already dived into that. You've got a very strong morning practice and I can't encourage the people that are listening more than to pay attention to that because I still have I don't care what I do, right? I get up every morning an hour before I need to and I either and it's it's dealer's choice. I'm either journaling or I'm praying and meditating or I'm doing a combination of both or I'm reading I'm reading a book that I need to catch up with. Something in the morning, making my list of things that, you know, like my high priority uh, items that I need to accomplish. Uh, the important thing is that I take some quiet time for me and it has to be early yeah. in the morning. The latest it can be is five o'clock in the morning because six o'clock just seems to be shit just starts to happen. Shit just starts moving around. People start talking, stuff outside starts bustling and it makes it more difficult for me to connect. So what I get for that one hour in the morning, for some people, that's a lot. You could just start right. with 15 minutes. You could just start with a half an hour. But I did that, and it wasn't enough. I did it too, and it wasn't enough for me either. You find that once you start doing it, you're like, oh, my God, 15 minutes. Yeah, what the fuck? And then you yeah. get up, and you, you start actually you know, like 15 minutes. I'm barely just getting the momentum going, right? Like I'm moving to the to my chair, getting my water ready, programming my my timer for the 20 minute slot, maybe picking my morning meditation, the guided meditation. I use insight timer, you use calm. So that does take a little bit of time to get into that zone, but that's also part of the ritual, right? And totally. I, I don't know about you, but I've been doing it now for wow, close to a year now. And now I've gotten to the point where if I don't do it, I significantly feel it. And I'm just, I am compelled to like, oop, I didn't Oh, and, and that happened to me today. It actually happened to me today where I actually, I gave myself a today where I was going to sleep in because I have a really busy end of the week out here. And so, and my, my, my friend's kids, they like to come in and wake me up, which I don't have kids, so I don't mind. It's kind of refreshing. But what, I, I had to go run an errand and on my way back, I just... I was listening to uh, uh, like a devotional and I, all I could hear was, 
no matter what, when you get back, you've got to go into that room and you've got to get down on your knees and you've got to do your meditation and your prayer, like, or things can go bad fast. (laughs) (laughs) You know? Yes, yes. And the cool thing is, um, for the prayer part, you can do that any time of the day. You can anywhere. That one, that one's. You can go into a, a public bathroom, and and close the stall door. I've I've done that before, you know. But you know, being mindful that that morning time where where it needs to be quiet. Wow, if you if you are religious about that, it is a game changer. You will start it's- your day just completely intentional on fire, on yes. fire and intentional. Yeah, and you know it's so funny because the devotion I was listening to was talking about the 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 commander, whoever commanded the forces to go that when they took Osama bin Laden and he talked about first thing in the morning making your bed and right how once you make your bed and you finish that one little goal, it propels you on to your next goal, right? And so for me, I do actually make my bed as part of my morning routine, but it comes after my gratitude, after my devotional, after prayer. And then exactly what you said, like I have a spot in my room where I sit and I look, I face out my window when I do my meditation. And it's it's a routine, it's a ritual, and it gets me into that mindful where my mind is rested, where whatever those thoughts that happen to be going through my mind at the time, I can become cognizant of them without judging them, but just stay in that restful state for however long. And I, and I sometimes, sometimes I go longer than 10 minutes, you know, it just all depends on how I'm feeling. You know, I, I don't know about you, but for me, like sometimes I get into the, it's this like mindfulness groove where I'm like, Man, I just want to keep going. You know what I mean? Where it's like, <laughs> right? Where the bu- the bell goes off, and I'm like, I'm I'm just gonna turn this. I'm gonna do ten more minutes, or I'm gonna do another however long. You know? I have been and, there. I have yeah. been there. Yes. You yeah. Get that, you get in that. You get in that groove. Totally, totally. And man, I and and I always know when I'm in that groove that, well, you know, there's good days and there's great days. Right. Uh-huh. My buddy and a tells me this: a good days when you your alarm goes off, you get up, you go to work, you hit every green light, you get all your work done at work. You get in your car, you drive home, you hit every good light, you lay down in bed and you don't pick up a great days when your alarm clock doesn't go off. You're late for work. You hit every red light on the way to work. Your boss chews your ass out. You screw up. You get in the car. You hit every red light home. You're home late and you get home and you lay in bed and you don't pick up. And that's a great thing. And so uh, I – right? So yes. I feel like when I'm in one of those mindful moods, I'm like, all right, man, suited and booted. This is going to be a rough day probably, you know? <laughs> My God knew that I needed this extra 10 minutes or 15 minutes of just meditating and being calm for whatever the day has in store for me, you know? You know, we could go – we, we got to move on because we could spend eight hours on this, you know, oh, yeah. but the, the important thing to remember is that I don't, you know, I have been in personal development and, you know, individual personal growth and, you know, just uh, uh, reinventing myself and rediscovering myself, you know, for the last 14 years. And the thing that is consistent about the thought leaders and the entrepreneurs that I listen to is their morning routine. They all mm. have one. All of them. Yeah. They all yeah. have one. Absolutely. All of them. No question they about all, it. They all read a lot too. Yes. Yes. That's something that uh, <laughs> I need to do a lot of that, a lot more of that too. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> I'm right. working on it. Progress, right. not perfection. I love it. Okay. So tell me um, or tell us. Daniel, how much clean time do you have and when is your anniversary date? Okay, so my anniversary date is May 17th of this year. So you have a you have what I consider still a newcomer. I don't know how many new I haven't heard too many newcomers on your show. So I have 181 days. I think today I take six months on Friday, actually. Okay, so what is it? May 17th? Yeah, May 17th. 2007, 2017. Mine is May 26th. Uh, but that's 2003. Uh, yeah, two, yeah. I was clean in 2003. That was one of my good years. <laughs> so this, so, well, we're going to get into the story, but what was it, uh, what was this last one? 
Was this was this was this a hardcore one, or was this one of those ones where it was like you were on some sort of uh, medical assistant treatment, or you were on the marijuana maintenance program, or you know, or or is this another one of your rock bottoms? Oh no, no, no! This one, I, th- the crazy part about this is this one was maybe the the shortest relapse on record, right? Like I wouldn't even I don't even know if there's a the, if relapse is the right word. It was like. But the truth is, it's a real, it's a really important part of my story too, because people, places, and things, right? right. Like I, I was in the parking lot of a meeting because I was doing three meetings a day at the time, right? Mm-hmm. And I was in the parking lot of this meeting, and for some reason, my phone went off. Somebody had no business being around, and in I just made up my mind, like I'm gonna go and I'm gonna smoke a joint. And that's what I did. And there's a process to that too. Just like there's a process for my morning routine. I had to drive. I had to pick this person up. She gave me some weed. I dropped her off. I went. I got papers. I rolled a joint. I start smoking this joint. And I got halfway done. I thought, I'm going to save this for half for later. And then as I'm driving back to my house, the thought – and this is the thought that came into my head. Okay, now what am I going to say to everybody in the rooms now? Like, how am I going to lie to everybody about uh, what just happened? And that thought scared the shit out of yes, me, right? Yes. Because when I lie, I get high, right? Mm. So I and so I started to then I started to panic. I was probably a little paranoid from the weed too, admittedly, you know. <laughs> so, but thankfully, I picked up my phone, right, and I called my sponsor, and he didn't fucking answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I have a, a hundreds of numbers in my phone, so I made the next call. And the next guy that answered, he's actually my sponsor now because I switched sponsors. And he picked up the phone, and I was like, what am I going to do? There's alcohol at my house because I live with people. I'm like, there's alcohol at my house. What am I going to do? He's like, just calm down. Just relax. You're going to be okay. So, I mean, the this lasted maybe, you know – I mean, the truth is it started who knows when, you know, I had I had a reservation is what it is. Correct. So it, it started well before I've even been able to put my finger on yet. But the process of it started when my phone went off in that in the parking lot of that meeting. And really, that's when the relapse happened, you know. Man. And, and so and so then that was it, you know. And since then, you know, like it says in the basic text, you know, that relapse for me provided the charge for the demolition process. You know, it was what I needed to to. To, to push me on to a more vigorous, you know, effort to, in the program. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it, you know, I mean, and I didn't lose everything that I had up to that point. Uh, I, but I did, I started my clock over in the spirit of honesty, because for this addict, I have to be brutally honest with the people in my fellowship I, or else it's, it's all bad. Amen, brother. Amen. I love it. I love the rigorous honesty. Love it. I have to have it, you know. It's just it's an absolute prerequisite for my recovery. All right. Excellent. Well, let's dive right in, buddy, because you are ready to go. So All it's right. time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life when you hit rock bottom, and then finally your journey into recovery up until today. So Daniel, take it away. All right. So I was born in 1977. And uh, I, I, I strongly believe that the day that uh, my mother gave birth to me was the beginning of a, a long, a long life of struggles because she said that I came out screaming at the top of my lungs. <laughs> And Don't. I was like, all right. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> Maybe, but she said I didn't stop for the first year of my life. So, <laughs> so okay. I was a colic baby, and I screamed for the first year of my life. Apparently, so you know, my I have amazing parents. You know, they're Christians. They raised me in the church, and which I have resentments towards, and I'm working through those. And so I, I grew up in in a, in a great family with parents that provided for me, but I've always was really strong willed. I, I I was always didn't like it when I didn't get my way. I didn't like to lose. And so my mom actually went back to work after I was in the second grade. I went to public school. She went back to work. So my sister and I, because I have two siblings, my sister's two years behind me. My brother's six. So at the time, he was just a baby. My parents wanted us to go to private school. So they put us in private school where we I went from third grade to eighth grade. And when I was in eighth grade, and so there's a really small school where we had really good teachers and and I got a really good education. And I always excelled at academics. 
you know, I'm one of those kids that I was one of those kids that a lot of people hate because they would work their ass off, you know, to get B's and I didn't do shit and I got mm. A's like I would do my math homework in class before it was due and get an A, you know, I, I call it spidey senses. Like you put a test in front of me and I can somehow I can just get all the answers right, you know. So and, and that's a really important part of my story because I've I was blessed with this really amazing memory, which my little brother also has it. And so I always was just able to, you know, lean on that memory that I was blessed with that it was a gift from my higher power, I believe. And so, so my addiction, you know, I probably drank and I know you're I usually asked this for the first time I was, I was in the eighth grade with one of my buddies and, uh, we went up to, uh, a, a, a timeshare that he had in Lake Isabella and somehow we had alcohol. So I must've been, I'd smoked cig a cigarette or two before that, but I, I got drunk for the first time, which is which is hilarious because I don't have a problem with alcohol. Like that's when I when I got out of prison, I told myself that right. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with alcohol. So, but now having after having worked some steps, you know, and working my fourth step and and realizing that man, I got hammered when I was about you know 13, 14 years old with my friend Jason, and I don't really remember much about it. You know, I just remember like being loose, getting loose, you know, and we were running through the woods because it was up in these mountains and tripping on a log and smashing my face and just pressing on, you know, like it didn't hurt till the next day. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. it gave me the courage, you know, that liquid courage to just get up. And I think, I think maybe I fell in the fire. I mean, it was, it was a total train wreck, right? So, so me and alcohol have always had a love hate relationship. You know, it's for me, it was in later years. It normally was just a, a, well, it's always where it starts for me, but once I start getting really loaded, you know, it's just a supplement. It's just to level me out, right? So, so, so I was in eighth grade, and uh, I, I got drunk for the first time, and my next door neighbors were growing weed in their closet because, you know, I'm a Southern Cali guy, right? So, so I, I one of the kids at school, at private school, wanted some weed, so I sold them some weed, right? So I sell so I sell them this weed and. Somehow word got out and someone ended up telling on me. So I got snitched out. This is the first time I'd get snitched out over and it would happen t several times in my life. But this was the first one. So for me, it wasn't it wasn't just necessarily the substances that I'm addicted to, but it was that criminal lifestyle. Also, yes. right. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. It was that running and gunning, mm. being on the streets, you know, and I, and, and I heard your story. Right. And uh -huh. that inspired me like because I realized that there's some kind of attraction to that lifestyle that you know tough guys end in prison or dead that's that's where tough guys go you know and that machismo attitude right and so I always wanted to be a tough guy and, and in eighth grade it sort of started so then in my high school years it was a little bit different you know like I actually that was a little hiccup you know, uh, they actually had some police officer come and give me the third degree and 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 I didn't tell him anything. And, and it was whatever, you know. So then I went on to public high school where I was actually a good kid. I got back into the church and uh, I started I, I, I played football and I wrestled and I loved that. And I, I and, but even in that there was addiction. I would ditch school. You know, my sophomore year in high school, I would ditch school to go to the weight room and work out. Right. So to, in retrospect, that obsessive compulsive behavior has been there for for probably all of my life. You know, absolutely. So so I would ditch school and I would, I would go to the go work out in the weight room. Right. So my grades started to falter when I was in high school because I spent all my time working out and not going to class. And depending on depending on that memory that I had. Right. So my sophomore year, I also enrolled in what's called PALS, peer assistant leadership. Right. So it was a peer leader training class. So I've always had this heart to help other people, you know, like. Uh, and, and even to this day, service is like a really big deal to me. And we'll get into that. But so I'm in this pals class and, you know, I'm struggling in school. And my teacher, Mrs. Clazy, she approached me and she, she said, Daniel, you know, they have this test in California. It's called the California High School Proficiency Examination or CHESPI. And you can take this test as a sophomore and test out of high school and go right into junior college. And so I was like, 
That's it. Uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Fuck high school, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to college, you know, because I, 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 you know, I had aspirations to go into either law or medicine. And so by the time, so I did. So I took this test and uh, I had started hanging out with older people at my church, you know, a little bit older than I was, had already graduated from high school. So I was 16 and, you know, I had friends that were had graduated the year before. So they were 18, 19 years old. Right. So that was it. That encouraged me to, to take this step. My parents supported me. So I tested out. I tested out of high school. And at 16, I I started junior college, you know, and I was taking a full load at Riverside Community College wow. in Riverside, California. I was taking 20 units. Jesus. And I was getting A's in all my classes except one. And the only reason I wasn't getting an A's because the teacher didn't hand out A's. So I was getting a Right. I was getting a B. The little there's that little competitiveness that I have there. Totally. So I was getting a B in that class and I was two months in. I was about a month and a half. It was the second month in. It was September. September fourteenth. And I don't I to this day have a hard time remembering it. September fourteenth and I and, and and another important aspect of this is I really believed like I I was as a young person, I, I thought I spent time in prayer. I thought I knew what my God's will for me was. I believed it was to test out of school, and I still believe it was to this day. And so I did, and I'm in college, and one day on September 14th, I think I dropped my sister off at high school, and uh, I'd left. And for a long time, all I could remember was waking up in the hospital. And uh, over time, scattered memories came back, but I ended up getting T-boned by a guy that I went to high school with on a residential street. Ooh. And I, I suffered severe head trauma. So I woke up in a hospital bed and that memory that I had had ever since I was a kid was gone. So which memory? And exactly, right? <laughs> so that that great memory that I had and you know why oh, the great Oh, you mean I had your superpowers. My superpower was gone. Oh exactly. shit. So I, I, I woke up and I was in the hospital for about five days and the doctor told me that it would probably take me a year to 18 months for my brain to recover. Now, mind you, this is like 1994. So the, 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 the scientific information that we have today on severe head trauma is – vastly more than we had in 1994 right like so there are there are det detrimental things happen to us in our brains when you suffer severe head trauma that we didn't even know back then that we know now thank you nfl right yeah so so i i boom i wake up in a hospital bed you know and i can't finish my classes you know so i'm i'm basically at home in bed for a month after this accident my memory slowly comes back. I mean, right after the first probably 10 days, you know, I wasn't like in too big of a fog, but I was in a fog for a month. Had to drop out of all my classes. You know, I, I, I had to go and work for my political science teacher just to get a C in the class. I had to grade papers for her and do stuff. So I became resentful towards God. Yeah. And that's really – that was – that was the crossroad in my life as a young 16 year old in college, you know, and, and, and not having the tools or not using the tools maybe that my parents had taught me. And, and one day waking up and saying, you know what, God, fuck you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like things weren't supposed to work out this way. Right. Like I was, I'm supposed to be 20 years old in medical school. I'm not supposed to be struggling. In, in my math class to remember or struggling in history just to remember what the teacher just said. And so, you know what, man, I'm going to go the other way. And that's exactly what I did. And so right somewhere around my 17th birthday, that happened in September. My birthday's in December. Yes. Anybody that does math, I'll be 40 in a couple weeks. <laughs> According to my sister, the end of Daniel's youth which I, I, I don't agree. I'm still a young 40. Thank you, California Department of Corrections. <laughs> but, <laughs> and arrested development, right? So, oh, yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. So my body may be 40, but I'm still got the mind of a young man, you know? So, <laughs> so I started going the other way, oh, and it started with, uh, you know, it started, it started with drinking and marijuana. That's how it started for me. You know, so I started smoking pot with another good friend of mine who she's been clean for going on 20 years now. 
and uh, her and her husband are clean. And it, it it's, I got I smoked a joint with her. And, you know, I had smoked a couple joints before that, but it was never really it never really led to anything else. It was like I got paranoid and I, I didn't want to do it anymore. But this time was like balls to the wall. So I started smoking weed and kind of like what happened with you. I started selling weed. Right. Mm -hmm. And it went from buying a 20 because I was a bus boy at Black Angus. So I have cash money every night. So I buy sacks of weed. And then when everybody found out that I had it, it was like, oh, Daniel can get some weed. So then I'd sell everybody weed. And that turned into ounces and ounces eventually turned into pounds, turned into taking pounds from Riverside to Vegas and I, I actually moved to Vegas in, you know, in 1997. I moved to Vegas and ended up picking just just a party with my friends, ended up in jail in Vegas twice for possession of marijuana. I was actually going to buy. This is kind of a funny story. I'm, I, I go move with my three friends, one of them in a wheelchair that I if he if he wasn't in a wheelchair, I would have went to prison way before 2000. I mean, I mean, he not only got out, got us out of a lot of trouble, but he also would have probably got us into a lot more trouble uh, if he could walk. Ah, okay, I got you. Right? Yep. Kind of like, kind of like, there's a, there's a, a Ice Cube has a song called "Ghetto Vet." You know, everybody want to put their dope on me because I don't get searched by the LAPD. <laughs> so, I mean, that's real <laughs> shit, man. We had, we would always put our our dope on him, and he never got searched. So, I mean, I got pulled over with a gun with him we got pulled over with pounds of weed and didn't even get searched and just crazy stuff with him right so that's basically what happened after that accident was i just i shook my fist at god i was mad at him and i was like i know this is not how you want me to live but i'm gonna live this way anyways and so event eventually what's kind of ironic about my story is about a year later i i ended up getting a thousand bucks from this car accident. Some insurance company paid me a thousand dollars. They said it was my fault, but for some reason, they they wanted to give me money. And I was I was smoking weed and drinking. And I uh, my buddy I, I didn't have a car. My buddy wanted to drove me to it was like Newport Beach to pick up this check. And we got this check. And I said I want to smoke some dope, Ooh. right? Like. For whatever reason, for some reason, I had a thing about snorting. Like, I don't want to put anything in my nose. Let's go get a glass pipe and smoke some speed, right? I don't know. I don't know if that was just from being in Riverside where, you know. We all got our thing, man. We all got our thing, man. So I was like, all right. like, I, And one of the things I would never do was use a needle, right? I would yeah. never do that, yeah. right? Like. Yeah. Not me. I don't do needles and I didn't want to snort anything. So so we took that thousand bucks and we went and bought some speed from my neighbor that I grew up with and I and I started smoking speed. And I went on a run for uh probably two years after that, until I was about nineteen, and then I transitioned. And then I was like, oh, man, you know, life got totally out of control. I lost my job. I lost a couple jobs. Then it was just supplementing my income, selling dope and whatever I could, you know. And so then, I, okay, and then I moved to Vegas. So and, 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 and about six months before the Vegas move, I had transitioned from the smoking the speed to now I was hanging out with a different crowd. And now we started doing a lot of blow, right? Because I, I love blow. I mean. Who doesn't? I, who does it? You know what I mean? Right? I'm sorry. Like, I, I just, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's true. For, yeah, a, yeah. for a minute. For a minute. For a minute. Let's not, let's know, not get too. Of, yeah, let's not get too crazy. And one of the one of the things I'll never forget in one of the first meetings I went to was a guy said, when I, when I first got loaded, it was fun. And then it was fun and there were problems. And then there were just problems. Yes. And so yes. I'll Love never that forget that because that doesn't that just speak to our lives yes. as addicts and active addiction, you know? Like, 100%. 100%. Like getting high was a blast at first and then problems came. And then that's all it was was problems. And then it was just chasing that bag and, and, and you know, even that criminal lifestyle, just trying to live in that life. And so – and so – I, I, I transitioned to blow, and so then I was doing a lot of blow and selling blow. Matter of fact, uh, one of my friends and I used to he, – he, he's a Cuban guy, all right? He's a Cuban guy, and he, he and his family used to sell keys, and they, they had a family business. And we used to take these kilos, and we would – he had a canner, 
right? So we would take these empty cans and we put these keys in these cans and seal them and then put like jalapeno labels on them or pickle labels and we'd take them to FedEx and we'd ship them to Missouri. Holy shit. So, yeah, we were shipping keys to oh Missouri. Oh my God, through the yeah. mail system? Through, through the mail system, yeah. Balls. Right. Balls yeah, to the yeah, wall, really dude. Ballsy. It's really ballsy. It wasn't my risk. I just had fun doing it and I got to just partake in the in the in the spoils you know what i mean because uh-huh. you better believe every one of those keys that we packaged had about at least an ounce out of it that went in our pocket you know what i'm so so <laughs> yeah yeah so so you know we were doing that and things just you know they got crazy so then in um in 2000 so 2000 is another life-changing time for me in 99 2000 around then you know, there were times when things got so unmanageable that I just I wanted to quit where I was just at the end of my rope where I was uh, I don't want to say that I necessarily at those times had the gift of desperation. Maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. But I really wanted to quit, you know, and I tried, but I couldn't stay away from my friends, man. Like I, I, I just at that point in my life, even though having been raised in the church and with a really strong spiritual background, you know, and one of the things I want to point out is I would remember all these nights coming home to my parents' house early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, and my mother in the same spot that I remember her in every day of my life, man, sitting in her chair, reading her Bible and praying. You know, and I always so so I so I had a really amazing example of someone that was a prayer warrior that was disciplined to wake up and have that morning time. So, you know, this isn't something I just picked up on my own or that I just picked up from recovery. You know, it was something that my mother instilled in me, you know, and I remember being ashamed and hiding from her and scooting into my room as fast as I could, you know, like. And, and, and at 21, 22 years old, I'm still living at home, you know, and I'm still coming in, you know, still coming in at five in the morning and my mom is still there praying. So wow, there was a time I really wanted to stop, man, when it was like I just couldn't stop. I just couldn't stay away from my friends and I'd stay away for a few days and then I'd go back. And, and I remember one time staying away for probably 10 days in 2000, you know, when, when things were about to get really, really bad for me. And, and, and still going back to my friends and even bringing my Bible with me, right? Like, I'm going to bring my Bible and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to read my Bible. Well, you guys all smoke dope. Like, come on, dude. How long is that going to last for? That lasted for like five minutes, you know? Exactly. And then I'm back smoking dope with them, right? So mm-hmm. so in 2000, um, I'm smoking dope and uh, I started doing like and, – and anybody listens to the Dopey podcast, I tell one of these stories. I don't know what episode it is. It's like – 76 or something where you know i started swiping jewel jewelry from jewelry stores and selling it on the streets you know like i robbed i robbed a few connections i would have people that would reach out to me and say hey this guy owes me money will you go and you know take from him and so i would go and i would do that and so that mentality of like i'm tough and you know carrying a gun you know i had some uh i had some south sider friends south siders anybody doesn't know that's like southern mexican-american gang members you know and they're typically affiliated with you know with with the ma or some sort of mexican mafia component that's some hardcore shit homie and and you know what by by the grace of god you know what's crazy is my one friend right that was the main guy um actually two of them within the past couple months i've seen both of them they're both clean Neither one of them lived that lifestyle anymore. But back in 2000, my friend Carlos, you know, he 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 had asked me and he probably doesn't even remember this because I think we were all loaded out of our minds. He asked me if I wanted to do some runs, right, like runs from Riverside to Arizona a Riverside to Vegas a Riverside to Phoenix runs. Right. Where I would just pick up a car, drive the car. And I was all about it. I was like, hell, yeah, I want to do some runs, you know, make a few G's. You know, I'm a white boy. Just jump in the car and drive, you know, get paid. Right. Easy money. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Thankfully, I ended up getting arrested and going to prison and I never ended up doing that. (laughs) So, (laughs) right. So I I, saw at some point I was broke and I was like, you know what, man, I'm going to I want to I want to rob this bank. So what? So I went. Yeah. Just 
just a grimy little addict. Think I'm somebody. I decided by yourself. Rob- yeah, by myself. So Dude. I borrowed my I borrowed my friend's car and I went and I robbed this bank and I, I didn't get that much. You know, it was like a tr- it was like a trial run for me. You know, I I, I robbed this bank and I got like a, a little bit over a thousand bucks and. I went and drove to my friend's house and I was like, wow, I started getting a taste for it, right? So I was like, okay. So I started making all these plans about how I'm going to rob these, this jewelry store. I'm going to start robbing these banks and doing all these things. And thank God I never got to that because uh, this girl that I used to get loaded with, that was my crime and, and she had got arrested and had got a program and took off from this program, right? So... She, she went AWOL from this rehab. So she calls me and says, come pick me up. So I had already spent all the money from the bank. That was like probably five days before this, right? I mean, a thousand bucks doesn't go far, you know? So I, 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 and I actually, after I robbed that bank, went to the one and only rehab that I've ever been to. I went, I was there for like two days, two, three days tops. And I was like, man, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I'm getting out of here. And I remember these guys praying over me in this, at this camp. You know, and saying, hey, bro, you know, like, God bless you. Best of luck to you. And I still had probably 500 bucks in my pocket, brand new clothes from, you know, the little bank that I did that thank God that they didn't catch me for that one. But but it's such peanuts. Ba- it's so it's such peanuts. You know, it's like how, how much am I willing to give up for how little, you know, like. I, 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 you know, I reflected recently on, on this and on my life and how much I was willing to give up for how little, you know, and give up my relationships with my family, give up relationships with my community, give up re- relationships with the law. Like if you're in good standing with the law or you're not, you know, and you're a lawbreaker or you're not. And, and, and unfortunately for me over the course of my life, it turns out that I was willing to give up 10 years of my life. For three hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, wow! Yeah. So man. I I ended up robbing this place in Tustin, California, with this girl, and I, I went into this place and I had it planned out, and I didn't end up getting the money I went there to get. I only got the money from the register, and her and I driving away, nobody chasing us. She was driving. We crash into a car, and. This is another turning point in my life where we crash into this car. A neighbor ends up calling the police, and it's a long story. And uh, do you want me to get into that story? It's pretty long. I don't know how much time we have here. Well, but, 46 minutes in. Try and paraphrase, but this sounds interesting. <laughs> so, let's, right, so, so let's. I robbed this restaurant. I robbed this restaurant. I, I'm in, and I'm out. I walked into this neighborhood where I had the girl park the car. She's driving. She crashes. It turns out I didn't know this, that she's freaking blind as a bat. She's like her vision's like 240 over 320 or something like outrageous. Like I didn't know this at the time. And she's your and so wheel man. Nighttime and she crashed. She's my wheel man. She was scared. I, I mean, in hindsight, she probably didn't really want to do it. But, you know, I, I mean, she wanted to do it because we were broke and we wanted to get loaded. You know, right. she was a dope fiend, too. And so we we did it, you know, and I thought this is easy. I'm just going to go get this money and get out. So we crash. The guy whose truck we crash into invites us into his house and he takes us in his house. And I'm like, yeah, let's go in the house because I, t- I took a quick look at the car and realized, like, well, we ain't going nowhere in this car. You know what I mean? This is more than a flat tire. So we go to the guy's house. We're sitting in the guy's house talking to him and he gets up to – to, to make a copy of my driver's license because I tell him, oh, it's no big deal. In hindsight, I never would have given the guy my driver's license, but whatever. Uh, so I give my license. He gets up and I, I hear, hear, right, Orange PD, and the cops are at the door. So I end up going out to the cops thinking that, you know, I'm going to win an Oscar. You know, I'm going to go out there and <laughs> the Oscar goes to Daniel Heron, you know, right? And they end up finding the money. I, I had given her the 350 bucks. I didn't even know how much money it was at the oh. time. I thought it was a, a few thousand. And for months, I thought the cops had stole the money. And my lawyer was like, the cops stole the money. I know it. And I'm like, yeah, I know it too. No, nah, they didn't steal the money, man. It was just 350 bucks. Oh, that was it. Oh, my God. <laughs> so the cops come and they arrest me. And I, 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 try, I try to play it off to them, you know. And um, – and, the lady comes that that was actually working the register and IDs me on scene and the cops high five each other 
And, and, and this is a really relevant part of the story because it just kind of juxtaposes how my life used to be and how I thought when I was on the streets and, and how I am now in my recovery, right? So the police officer comes up to the window and they put both of us in the back of the car, myself and my crime partner. And uh, I tell her, no matter what, don't say anything to the cops. And she says, well, what if they're recording this? And I said, it doesn't matter if they're recording this. They can't use it against us. Just don't say anything. So the cop comes up to the window and he says, can we search your car? Because they were looking for the gun, right? And I said, no, it's not my car. And that's the only thing I ever said to the police officers. And I fought my case for a year. So they went and searched and they couldn't find the gun. He comes back and he's like, tell me where the gun is and I'll go to the judge and I'll put in a good word for you. I just didn't say shit. Good. And then they went and he comes back and he was like, you better tell us where that gun is or some kid gets his hands on that gun and something happens that's going to be on you. And I didn't say anything to that cop. And his name was Officer Robbins. And I actually have this respect for him because – he, from the minute he laid eyes on me, he knew it was me. And the rest of his of his comrades, I, I had a bunch of, you know, but he knew from the gate that it was me. And once they arrested me and Mirandized me and, and found the gun, and when we got in the car on the way to the station, he started talking to me about the Lakers or something, right? Like he just chopped it up like some normal conversation. And, 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 and I did talk. I don't remember what we talked about. It had nothing to do with my case, but it was just like a really normal conversation, you know, and I reflect on that and how calm and how cool I was at that time, you know, under the, the, those circumstances. And I've always, always been like that when the shit's gonna hit the fan i'm always really calm and i'm really cool and and i see parallels in my recovery now where i'm at a place of change in my life now where the good shit's hitting the fan and it actually started to scare me a couple weeks ago because i'm like oh shit you know like this is when when the shit hits the fan i'm always really calm and it's normally bad but now it's actually good you know what i mean and so there's sometimes that fear of, well, what am I going to do next? Because what I'm used to doing is going and getting loaded and going and getting a gun and going and doing something crazy. And now it's like I just – I seek out counsel. I call my sponsor. I call my brothers in recovery, you know, and a few sisters that I have and I talk to them. I talk to my parents, you know. So I end up getting arrested for this robbery and I was calm and I was cool and they brought me in and they started the recorder and asked me to state my name and I didn't say anything. So – I go to and uh, I was an angry young man. I was 22 years old, and and uh, I, I the first phone call I had with my mom was like, "I want a fucking lawyer. Get me a lawyer. I'm gonna beat this." And after I was done going on a rant towards my mother, right? She says, "I'm just. I just thank God that I know where you are now." Ooh. And, uh, you know, I think back about that because it makes me really think about all the pain that I've caused my mom and my dad and my sister and my brother and my entire immediate family who are an anomaly in the world as far as I can see because my whole immediate family has been nothing but supportive, not only of me but of our entire family. No one judges. Everyone just supports everyone and is there for everyone for my whole life. So – for my first probably four months in county jail, I was on a rampage, man, and I was angry and I acted violently. But there was one day, but what, But I started reading the Proverbs, and I don't know why, but I, 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 I got a Bible, and probably a month in, every day, I would start reading a proverb a day, and I started reading the Proverbs. And there was this one guy named David that I hated this guy's guts from the minute I set foot in this jail, right? In this housing, it was G. It was a dorm in Orange County. And and but in, in, there's politics. And so I couldn't you can't just beat people up that are your own race, right? So he was a white guy, I was a white guy, so I hated him and I just waiting for an opportunity to beat this guy's ass, right? So a, a couple months in, it's probably uh, maybe four might be an exaggeration. It was probably three months in, the the shot caller in the dorm was like, hey. It's go time, Daniel. David messed up, and now we gotta. He, he he's got to be dealt with. So, me and this other guy took him into this blind spot in this uh in this in this in this pod, and we we beat the shit out of this dude. You know, bad. I remember beating them bad. I remember smashing his head on this concrete wall, and 
but something happened, you know, and I, I went up to the shower to shower. And uh, so now I'm there naked showering, you know, just me. And there was this ex South Sider named Luke, whose name used to be trigger. And they called him the preacher man. And they used, he used to do a prayer every night in this dorm before we went to sleep. And I remember being up there showering with them and I just started to cry, you know, and, uh, he, he just looked, I go, I don't know what's going on, man. Like, I don't know what's happening. I don't, I don't understand why I feel this way. And the reality was that was really the first time that I had a gift of desperation and a spiritual awakening simultaneously, simultaneously. Right. And he looked over at me and said, you're going to be all right, man. You're going to wow. be all right. Wow. And he, you know, he had been to a similar place. Right. And so from that point on, um, I, I didn't use from the day I got arrested, I didn't use and I ended up becoming the preacher man in that dorm. So my faith was was invigorated from that point on. And the, uh, there was still a lot of progress that had to happen. My anger problems I still had to deal with. But from that day until a year later, so I ended up catching 12 years. I got I got 12 years for armed robbery. I got two years for a robbery and 10 years for using a firearm in the commission of a felony. And um, I smoked a joint. When I got to prison in reception center in Watsco State Prison, I smoked a joint. And, and, and it's relevant because I had forgot about that joint that I had smoked. And my experience from this last time in May when I smoked it was very similar, right? Where I, this, this, this really healthy fear, I had this healthy fear where I smoked this joint after a year clean and I looked out my window in my cell and I saw all these guys looking, all these faces out of these cell windows. And I thought to myself, or maybe it was the voice of God. I don't know what it was, but this is what your life will be if you keep getting high. Right. And so from that time forward until all, almost nine whole years later, which I smoked a joint again, I was clean in prison and, uh, I, it was faith based. I just I, I, I stayed in in the scriptures and I I discipled men and I just I was a mentor to many men and and by the by the grace of my God he 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 blessed me with great wisdom and I even shot callers would even come to me from time to time and ask me for advice on how to deal with situations in the dorm or in in different prisons that I was in and it was just it was really amazing man just to see how. That clean life was. But then I got out of prison and within the first week of getting out, I paroled to my same neighborhood. I start drinking. Mm. And, you know, at the bottom of some bottle is a sack. I don't know. Yes. What it is. Yes. For some people, it's the first one. For me, I was able to manage that drinking for, you know, for six months after getting out. You know, I was smoking weed again. And and the weed for me usually ends with a mountain of weed or a grow of weed. It doesn't normally end in me smoking dope or snorting dope or shooting dope, which I had never done up to this point. It normally – for me, my marijuana use after my parole turned into me doing a grow before it was legal, right? So – you know, I'll never forget the first day I stepped foot in a marijuana clinic. It was like I stepped foot in heaven. You know, I was like, oh, you know, oh, oh, this is what heaven looks like, like a candy store for potheads. You know, it was fantastic, you know. And so but one time drinking too much with the fellas was turned into, hey, man, like who can get some blow? Let's do some blow. Right. Let's let's keep this party going. You know, so. That's exactly what happened to me. I managed my drinking and I was a weekend warrior from about, you know, 2010 when I got out till 2015. And in 2015, I, I ended a really long relationship with a woman that's a really fantastic woman. And I wasn't right. You know, I was sneaking out on the weekends and doing blow with my buddies. And, you know, you know how that goes, right? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> too, too good. Too well. Right. So it's hiding it from her, you know, and the double life, and the double life, you know. And so eventually, eventually um, I broke up with her and I had saved up a bunch of money. You know, that year I ended up making a hundred grand and I made a hundred grand a year before that. So I was her and I were actually looking to buy a house. And instead of buying a house, you know, I decided that I was just going to start partying balls to the wall. And so I 
I met this amazing woman. I thought she was a bartender. And you know what? She is an amazing woman. And she was in her addiction. And so her and I were – we called it the, 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 the love cave. And we wouldn't leave her apartment for months. We didn't leave her apartment. And one time – and she took pills and we did coke together and she's an alcoholic in recovery now. And uh, her pill connect wanted some speed. And I, I was selling – I started selling blow. I started picking up ounces again, right? I mean, right? That's just – right? Like that first drink when I got out turned into me selling ounces of coke, turned into me taking some of those pills to my coke dealer and trading it for some speed. It's fast. And It's fast. And I took it to I took it home to her apartment, and she went into her closet and got a speed pipe. And I said, I said, Denise, I said this ends really bad for me. And she loaded that pipe, and I smoked it with her, and that ended, which is kind of ironic with me on December 9th of 2016, for the last time having a needle in my arm after after entering recovery. Right. For the putting a needle in my arm all by myself and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I just I don't want to do this anymore. And that was probably a week after I'd gone to the first meeting I'd ever went to. So 2015 turned into crazy, turned to smoke and speed every day, turned into me running my business into the ground, turned into me running the streets, picking up large amounts in the end. Ended up with her and I, just me becoming verbally and physically abusive with her and her physically and verbally abusive with me and just a, a train wreck of a relationship and a train wreck of addiction that I have. I created tons of wreckage that I'm still in the process of cleaning up, which will take years and us breaking up and eventually me putting a needle full of speed in my arm. Oh, my God. Which was one of those not I, not yet. Right. You're mm -hmm. eligible to too. You know, like I haven't done that yet. And I was my fuck it level had got to such and such a degree uh, at the end of 2016. And, I, and I, I, I was doing steroids and I had all these needles in my safe. And eventually I just loaded up a big shot of speed, shot some speed. And then, you know, that lasted for about four months until I found myself in El Paso, Texas with a bunch of dope and uh a bunch of dope fiends, and actually the guy whose house I'm at right now, I was I was on my way to Oklahoma through El Paso, Texas. So that's how strung out on dope I was. I was basically driving through Mexico from California to get to Oklahoma. I don't I mean I was just out of my mind, right? Dude. Just and my buddy Aaron crazy, dude. And my buddy Aaron calls me and he's like, How you doing, man? And I was like, bro. I'm going to fucking die, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to die, man. And he's like, so we hang up the phone and like a minute later, the phone rings and it's him again. And it's his wife, Gina. And I thank my, I thank my God every day for them. And she said, leave your car in that airport, fly up here to Oakland and let's get, let's clean, get yourself clean. And so I left my, my, I left my car there and I flew up to Oakland. And for me, that's really where my recovery started. Even though I never set foot in a meeting before, when I got back to my car, uh, about five days later, my brother and my dad were waiting for me from California in El Paso airport because Gina had – my friend's wife had called and told my mom that I had dope in the car. Oh, thank my God. God. Yes. Thank God for getting told on, right? Like thank God. I lied to my brother and my dad because I was thinking I need to sell that dope for money, right? Like I'm broke. So I lied to them, drove home with the dope, sold the dope and – uh it was about a week after that that Denise, my ex-girlfriend and I, she she wanted to get clean too and she took me to my first meeting which was an AA meeting and I'll never forget sitting in that meeting and this is like the second gift of desperation for me in that little run and probably who knows how many over the course of my life, you know, because now I'm, I'm, I'm about to turn 39 years old last year and I'm desperate and I, and I, I'm, I, I want to stop, you know, and, and I even told her like, I'm quitting everything. I'm quitting smoking, no coffee, no anything. Right. And like three days of that. And she was like, please get a cigarette, <laughs> drink some fucking coffee. I beg you do something. Right. But I went to an AA meeting, a giant speaker meeting in Riverside, California. And you know they have those giant steps on the wall. And I read those steps, man, you know, 
My life has become, uh, you know, I, I'm powerless over my addiction and my life has become unmanageable. And I remember the hammer of God just smashing my soul and my will and just humbling me to a point where I just was sitting in this meeting crying. And I don't remember much about what that that speaker said that day. But I remember the next Thursday I went back to another speaker meeting. And then I, I, I had a job that was like out towards the desert, Banning, California, and I was desperate for a meeting. And so the first NA meeting I ever went to, I have the app on my phone and it was I wasn't going to make any of the meetings because they all start at 7 or 730. So I drove to my hood in Riverside, La Sierra, and there was a meeting at eight o'clock and I went to this meeting and it was Spanish only. And I don't speak any Spanish. And I... <laughs> But I was desperate. I just was like, I need something, man. And I went, yeah. I sat at this meeting. And after the meeting, every single one of those men in that meeting came up to me and they embraced me. Oh. And I just feel that love and that me too. And I'm so, oh, I'm so thankful for Narcotics Anonymous and for the 12 steps. And, and you know, uh, I have a list of cliches that I write down, right? And one of them, one of them is, God is not keeping me clean. I'm using the tools that he gave me and he gives me the strength. Oof. I love right? it. Right? And and the 12 steps and Narcotics Anonymous are one of those tools. And when I'm up here in Northern California, I go to AA meetings because they're strong up here, you know? And I and I go and I, I stay with the herd and I, I stick with the herd. And I just – I'm so thankful, man, that I was given that gift of desperation. So now here I am. I had that little hiccup, which was definitely the demo, the charge for the demolition that I needed. And now I'm just, I'm just, I just stay dived into my recovery. You know, my buddy that I'm up here with in July, he had a relapse and he called me and I flew up here. I said, look, bro, I called, I talked to my sponsor and I said, I will fly up there on two conditions. Number one, you go to a meeting every day. And number two, you get a sponsor. And he said, agreed. And I flew up here July 17th. And uh, that was my first experience in Northern California. And my brother, he got a sponsor. And he and I went to at least one meeting every day. And uh, I just I just try to do the suggestions that the people in the program give me, you know. And I have spiritual advisors inside the program and outside the program. So so that's part. So, so the only other little component of my story was in January of this year, because in, in December I got clean and I December last year I got clean and I went to my first meeting and I started going to meetings and then I would finances and romances right I would get in a fight with my with my girl and I would go get loaded you know and then I would get 20 days 24 days and we'd get an argument and I'd go get loaded you know and so finally I was like I'm getting out of here like I got to get out of here so I, I flew to Oklahoma I flew to Owasso Oklahoma where I, I got a home group in Owasso and I got my first sponsor named Dana. I actually ended up having two sponsors at one time. And my sponsor was like, dude, you got to pick one of us. You can't have two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Right? I'm glad yeah. that came out at some point. Yeah, it came out right away. And I'm like, and, and the, the thing is for all you newcomers and anybody that's out there still getting loaded, keep coming back, man. Like, I know you're sitting in this room and you're hearing these readings and you don't understand. Like I, that was me. Like I didn't understand. I was in Oklahoma taking Xanax and eating marijuana edibles for two weeks, going to a meeting every single day going, yeah, I'm in recovery. I'm clean. Right. And it took me time hearing the readings and being around everybody to understand this program, man, to understand what recovery is and to understand what being clean meant. Like I, 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 I thought it was okay. I thought as long as I wasn't smoking speed or shooting speed that I was clean, right? Like I don't have a problem with marijuana. I don't have a problem with alcohol. I don't have a problem with Xanax. Like my problem is speed. That's what takes me to prison, right? Wrong. Like that's a lie. <laughs> Like that's just the disease lying to us, right? And the disease will – it's cunning, baffling, and powerful and it will lie to us. And what I've seen in this short period of time, which is coming up on a year that I've been in actually recovery because I, I had resentments towards it because of my faith, which I was wrong. 
But now I, it's it's a program in Narcotics Anonymous at least. It's 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 abstinence from all mood changing, mind altering substances. You know, and and I know that there's 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 a there's debate over a doctor's care, and I'm all for a doctor's care, and I'm all for mental health issues and anything your doctor says. Just be prayerful and go to your sponsor and take things to your sponsor and to your fellowship before you make any decisions. We don't have to act compulsively and. Uh, impulsively anymore we we have we get to take time and take these things to our fellowship and to our support group right so keep coming back because eventually you will hear something that will set in that that light bulb will come on and that's what happened with me and so i'm in oklahoma getting clean and the light bulb came on and that was january 21st was my date that i gave back where I realized sitting in a meeting, it was actually an AA meeting, and I realized that I wasn't clean, that I'm sitting in this meeting and I, you know, was freaking high, you know? Dirty. And, right, and I just didn't know, you know? I just honestly didn't know, but I know now, you know? And so, so that's what happened. And about a month in, about a month in, Denise called me and said, Daniel, you got to listen to this program. And it was uh, that sober guy. Right. It was Shane. Yeah. Shane Raymer. uh, Shane Raymer. And he had an episode with uh, Tad Stringer, I think his name is. And uh, he talked about doing time. And Denise said, listen to this episode. And she gave me link to your podcast as well. And uh, and then honestly, when I first listened to you, I was like, man, who is this guy, dude? Come on. And then when I after I heard you on the dopey, I was like, oh, oh, man, you are <laughs> grimy, brother. You are a grimy addict. And, I, and ever since then, I've been hooked on and I love the Thursday episodes. Those are awesome, by the way. And uh, she said, you're supposed to do this, Daniel. You're supposed to do a podcast. And I said, wow, you know what? Maybe I am. So I prayed about it. And uh, and, and I so I started reaching out to people. And I reached out to Chris and Dave. And they were like, dude, just do it. I started reaching out to my old prison buddies. And um, I reached out to my friend Carlos Cervantes. And uh, he said, come down to downtown L.A. I work for this organization called ARC the anti-recidivism coalition. So I went down to downtown LA and I said, Hey, you want to co-host a show with me? And he was like, yeah, totally. And I was, I was getting on the elevator to leave. There's this, this uh, black guy with a floppy hat. That's what I say. I, I like to talk shit to him. This black guy with a floppy hat looked about my age, you know, and he had glasses. And I was like, so what do you do here? And he said, uh, Oh, he said, I'm the director of policy. And I said, Oh, what does that mean? He said, well, we, we write and support and advocate for bills to change laws in California to to for public safety and to encourage criminal justice reform. And I said, wow. I said, well, what are you working on right now? He said, well, we're working on a bill right now to give judges in California discretion over gun enhancements. And I said, well, you know what? I served under a gun enhancement and I had two judges tell me they did not want to sentence me to 10 years. And he said, come back here next Tuesday. We have a policy training. And so right away in my recovery, I started doing this podcast and I started doing uh, I started giving back, man, giving back. And I'm a member of ARC now and I'm a I'm a member of the policy team. And this year I went to Sacramento about seven times and I sat in front of lawmakers and I told my story. And this year we got nine bills passed to change laws in California. Yeah. And that's the reason I'm in Northern California right now. It's not that's it's not for the job. It's because. I'm here. My friend Elizabeth Calvin, who organizes our visits to uh, to the Capitol in, in California, she's taking an award because she's a lawyer for Human Rights Watch, and she's been doing this for over 20 years, and she's had 10 significant bills passed, and she got nine of them passed this year. So thank my God that even early on in my recovery, I've been given amazing opportunities to be of service, not only to recovering alcoholics and addicts, but also to uh, formerly incarcerated men and women, you know, and I, I've, I've had the privilege of going and, and, and participating in changing laws and inviting some of my friends on my podcast where we talk about the struggle to assimilate back into society after you've been in prison. And you know what? Oh, it's just like being an addict in recovery, man. Uh, There's so many similarities. It's unbelievable. 
You feel like you don't belong. You feel like you can't do it. You feel like you don't know any other way to live. All, all you know how to do is wake up for chow in the morning and do what you're supposed to do and, and, and follow those rules in prison. And you think everybody's looking at you. And, and, and the similarities are just – they're unbelievable. And man, what a, what a privilege it is, right? I mean I know you say it over and over. What a privilege it is to be able to do what we do and be able to just take a message of hope and take a message of, of recovery and and you can and you're good enough and you're never alone and me too right to anybody that's willing to listen man and i'm just yeah i'm blessed and you have me come on your show and now here i am about to take six months after having a significant amount of clean time and my first swing at recovery and i'm just so blessed man it's just unbelievable what god has given me And he's used Narcotics Anonymous in my life, you know, and it's just so powerful, man. And I just I just wake up and I'm looking out this window at this beautiful landscape with mountains and there's a vineyard I'm looking down at and there's beautiful blue sky and clouds in the air. And when we were out there getting loaded, man, we hated those morning birds. Oh, man. And shut up. (laughs) Right. And now it's like I I try to make a daily practice out of stopping and smelling the roses, man. Like that's real shit too. Like if I'm too busy to stop and smell some flowers that I'm walking by, then I'm too busy to enjoy this life that God has blessed me with. HP, baby. HP, baby. Oh, I love it. There there it is, bro. There it is, man. Well, you know what? And and I hope that the listeners – are just taking away so much of the intensity because you are an addict. You are an addict through and through um, yeah. in, in that <clears throat> I can relate to that, right? Because I am an addict, right? And I can relate to the intensity and I can relate to the passion and I can also relate to I'm either all in or I'm all out. Yep. There is that once I get a hold of something, once, once I get that high from it, you know, once once I connect with that high, I run with it. <clears throat> the good news is is that today we can connect with super super positive movements. The recovery movement is huge, um, huge. And even though we recognize, and I recognize just by your story, and the flip flopping back and forth between you know who you are and who you want to be, right? Who who you turned out to be. And then the fight and the struggle to become who you are. Right? Some of so the people, there's people out there listening that can almost understand what I just said there. Uh, but the reality is, is that we struggle. <clears throat> we struggle yeah. to to get in front of things. We struggle to get in front of uh, of, of this the, of this disease because it talks to us in our own voice. And you get to these points where you're like. How the fuck did I get here? Like how, oh God. why, what, what possible, what conversation did I have with myself where I justified, rationalized, and ultimately planned out my own demise and self-sabotage? Where and how does that happen? And then on top of that, how do I get in front of this thing? Um, listening to where you started, the, the level of, of, of just certainty that happen in your life over and over and over. So many white light moments, the, the ones that you had in prison. So many, man. I mean, I could go on and on and on, brother. Like how many times, like, it was like you, I knew that my higher power had a greater purpose for my life, right? Where it was like, there's no way I could have got through what I got through unless there was some power greater than myself looking out for me for some purpose greater than myself. Yes. You know? Yes. And and it's just on and on. I mean, uh, uh, five days before I, I found myself in El Paso, Texas, I was handcuffed on the curb up the street from my ex-girlfriend's house with my arm bleeding and a scale on the floor of my car and an ounce of dope in the car. Right? And I was sitting there saying to myself, how the hell did I get here again? And you know what? I know how I got there again. I know. Like I've, I've done the work and I'm doing the work to know. And it's what we started this. It's what you start every show off with. What do you do in your daily routine? Yes. It's the little things, man, that are the most important in my life for this addict. 
It's that time of prayer and meditation. It's that time of quiet. It's that devotional time in the morning. And when we begin to neglect those little things, the little things, the calling our sponsor, the staying plugged in with our members and the fellowship, that that the disease starts to get a foot, a toehold. And eventually that toehold will turn into a foothold. And before you know it, that foothold is a stronghold and your jails, institution and death. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Jails, institutions, and death. But I think the most important takeaway from all this, because as our, as our listeners are, are going through all this, right, it's, it's just that, holy cow, all of this, this, this culmination, a lot of what's happened has happened in the last year. Right? You're over. Oh, my gosh. What, what's your age? You're, you said you would just turn 40. When did you turn 40? I'll, I'll turn 40 December 5th. Okay, so you're coming so, up 40 years old, right? It's taken 40 years to get to, 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 to be beaten, literally yeah. beaten by the disease over and over and over and over again. Um, I just got back from Minnesota, right? I, was, I, I yeah. went to the Minnesota Recovery Connection to get certified as a peer recovery specialist. Um, and the biggest takeaway that I got from all that is the language we use. You know, yeah. so even though I recognize and I said, man, this guy's got this guy's got addict behavior written all over him on on <laughs> on everything, on everything. Right. Uh, yeah. The language that we use for ourselves is important. You know, I am a I'm a person in recovery or I'm a person in long term recovery. You know, uh, I'm an advocate for recovery. You know, being a now being a part of the ARC. Right. And there's so many movements in the United States that when I was there last week, uh, I was like, I should be here, right? right. Like, I should be, I should be, you know, in this movement on the front lines. Um, but you know, something I also realized too is is how God works in our lives is through this podcast. Like, I don't think I would have ever even known about this because I'm, you know, being in Costa Rica, there is no RCOs, there is no MRC, there is no. ARC, right? There right. isn't there, yeah. you know, and if I see those acronyms, I'm not going to take the time to read what they are, right? Um, I, I was, I grew up in the 12-step fellowship like yourself, Narcotics Anonymous, and there was it. That was it. I, right. I finished the 12 steps in the 12-step 12 12 step working guide in, in, in the um, Narcotics Anonymous step working guide. I finished that. It took me four years to finish, and I swore to myself, uh, you know, if for no other reason, I will never relapse again because I'm never working this book <laughs> for the rest of my life. Oh, I, my God. I'm, it's so hard, oh, right? Oh, it's a beast. But oh, the reality is I got to a point where it's like, is this all there is? Is this all there is? And right? the truth of it is it's no. It's This is not all there is, right? There is so much more. And when we, you get... When you get behind the so much more, then it gets super exciting because you stop, you know, the meetings are great on the ground level. But when you take it to the next level and you are now, instead of being an addict in recovery, you are now an advocate for recovery. Just that dialogue alone changes everything, you know. Uh, you know, getting out of prison, being in prison, being classified, like you're saying, the stigma behind being someone who was incarcerated, someone with a criminal background, right? This is the kind of shit that haunts you. Haunts right? you. And you know what? And that and addiction and incarceration go hand in hand because the most incarcerated people suffer from addiction. Of course. Almost all of us, whether we admit it or not. And so there, there is that, that component there where – you're an addict and you, whether you recognize it or not, like as a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, this awards uh, ceremony tonight called Uncommon Heroes with my friend Rudy Reyes, who's also an advocate and he's a member of CGA, Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous, right? Because he's addicted to the criminal lifestyle, right? And he's not addicted to substances necessarily, but he's an addict. Yes. You know? Yes, and, I do. And, and if you are incarcerated, you're more than likely an addict. And if you're and if you're not, you're a liar. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying, you know, so there's a huge component. And and to be able 
thrilled to to be, and for me to be able to go and do advocacy work like, oh, what I'm doing this week up here in Northern California is for, for a guy that's going to take six months on Friday, it's ridiculous. Like I'm going with a lady that was on my team. I was on her team last time I was in Sacramento. Like this lady is a giant in criminal justice reform, right? And I, I'm invited to go and see her take an award and she worked for Human Rights Watch. That's an international organization. I'm going to Stanford Law on Thursday. Tomorrow I'm going to Stanford Law and there's going to be a panel there and I and I'm going to be there as a part of this uh, uh this um I don't even know what they call it it's 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 a it's a uh uh, like a little convention on criminal justice reform. And I'm going to Sacramento on Saturday with a buddy of mine to go advocate for some uh, creating a space in every community college in California for formerly incarcerated people. And on Friday, I'm going to the prison law office, which is a group of lawyers that advocate for prisoner rights. It's like all of this, like if I wasn't clean, like if it wasn't for Narcotics Anonymous or for recovery, because it's not just Narcotics Anonymous, it's recovery yes. and it's my higher power. If it wasn't for that, if I was loaded, I wouldn't be doing any of this. If I was loaded, I wouldn't be doing anything good. I would be giving nothing positive to anyone in my life or anyone in society. But because I am like HP, baby, you know, <laughs> look at all these amazing things. And like you said, I'm just scratching the surface yes. of what my God has in store for me, you know? And so what I would, what I would also say too, is that based on this, what you're talking about and, here in Costa Rica, it's not the same, right? But since you're in the States, you know, what would you tell, you know, what kind of recommendations or advice would you give to someone that's new in recovery, much like yourself, who's got less than a year now, you're, you know, you're about to collect six months, but now you're about to go on a panel discussion, you know, you're, you're lobbying for, to pass laws, you were part of, you, you know, you're, you're part of this coalition, right? What can you tell people early in recovery that want to get involved? How soon can they get involved? Where can they go, right? Where, 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 can, they, where can they find uh, advocacy um, networks in their area? So this is my first sponsor taught me two things. Easy does it. Yes. And no matter what, don't pick up unless it's the phone to call me. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. And so, so for me, you know, and, 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 and my, my opinion is that each of us, you know, we, we, we get opportunities at, at a different rate of time and it's not the same for everyone. So for me, I, I, I try to consult with my sponsor before I make any big move, you know? And so for him, he's like, if you can be of service, be of service. But at the same time, like I have to have balance in my life. And so I've had to actually cut some things out. Because I'm still new in recovery, you know, and I don't want to become overwhelmed and find myself back into a corner that I can't get out of without getting loaded, you know. And so thankfully, I, I, I've learned pick up that phone. And when I'm in one of those spots, you know, I, I pick up my phone. And for me right now, by the grace of God, like I, I don't I don't want to get loaded. I don't want to drink. I don't want to get high. Like uh, that obsession was taken away from me probably – Three months after my little relapse, right? Like three months after that joint, I, I, I just – I didn't even think about getting high anymore. And when, when the shit hits the fan for me now, now I got other issues, right? Like now I, I get I, – I still get angry, you know, and I want to act out with my tongue or <laughs> – right? Like towards people, like yes. those behaviors start to come out, you know? And so – and that's not living clean. That's not living a life of recovery. That's not taking the principles – of the steps and applying them to every area of our life, right? And so for me, that's what it is. And so that's why the morning time is so important for me. And anytime I need to step away and take a deep breath. So that's what I would say. The most important things is easy does it, don't pick up. But for me, when early on in recovery, stay with the herd. Like people, places, and things. Like, look, man, if you think you can go hang out with your boys and not get loaded, you're fucking crazy. OK, like that's insane, dude. Like I, I can't do it. It's it was insane for me to think that I could go hang out with my boys and not get high on something. Well, and you you did mention that early on in the episode. Right. So let's touch a little bit more on that, because there is that large influence that comes from and, and also like the CGA. Right. Yeah. Which is all part of being connected to that criminal element 
being connected to that shadiness, right? That underworld sort of uh, bravado that comes along yeah. with being a gangster. You know, everybody yeah. wants to be a gangster, that kind of a thing. And totally. so, and so, there is so much bravado, and there's also so much protection, just in in and of it, uh, uh, even just in claiming to be a part of or knowing, you know, name dropping and and all, you know, and, and the talk, right? So, right. so when you're in a group of people, right, <clears throat> you're not sitting around talking about spiritual principles and values, you know, and that you're part of this advocacy program, you know, uh, so, because you're still needing that, that persona, that mask of yep. a badass, right, to protect you. To protect you from what? That is, you know, of your own choosing or your own manifestations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so for me, that whole mentality, you know, the the root of that for me is fear, right? Like I'm afraid that you're not going to accept me. I'm afraid you're not going to like me. I'm afraid that you're not going to think I'm tough and that you're going to try to get one over on me. And so I put on this mask, right? And the reality is that I'm just afraid, you know, I'm afraid, man. And so I, and I've come to find, you know, in, in a short period of time that, this is the case for a lot of what we do is is fear based. Uh, when we act out, when we get loaded, when we involve ourselves in that criminal thinking, a lot of it has to do with fear. Fear. A lot of uh, young men and women get involved with gangs initially because they're afraid, right? For a lot of the same reasons, so they, in, they involve themselves in gangs and in criminal activity to be a part of, right? And and now they're a part of, and now and and, and the reality is it's a lie. Right. It's a lie because jails, institutions and death, man. Same thing, man. Criminals and gang members, jails, institutions and death. That's where you end up, man. That's where you end up. And so working the steps, you know, digging deep and and, and being willing, you know, being honest with yourself, because if I'm not honest with myself, then I'm lying to everybody else. Yes. too, Right. Yes. And absolutely. being uh, man, when I on the fourth step, t- talking, up, looking at my feelings. Oh my gosh, that was so hard. I thought I was, I thought I was a sensitive guy, you know. I thought I was in touch with my feelings, and it's like, you know, what feelings do you uh, do you recognize that you know? Yeah, you know, I don't even remember the question. I remember thinking, I don't even know. Like, I don't have a clue. <laughs> Right. It's true. It's so true. I don't know what. I don't even know what you're asking me yes, right now. Yes. You know, and so. It takes it takes an effort, you know. It takes being with the herd and having a sponsor is part of being with the herd, you know. And you're you're vulnerable when you're outside the herd, like you said. If you're hanging out with people and you're talking that machismo talk and talking about sling and dope, and you're not talking about spiritual principles, and and I and I'm fine with telling war stories. I have no problem with that as long as we bring it back to where do we go from here, you know? Yes, yes. Which is exactly what we're doing now, right? We're exactly. reeling, we're reeling it in, and we're. Um, dissecting it because you, you know you have to dissect the mind of an addict. You know I, I understand you know that whole idea you mentioned before about that risk taking, giving up so much for so little. But in that moment, there is no actual conscious effort to look at consequences. There isn't. You don't even. There isn't. You don't open the door to the possibilities. You're not thinking about jail time. You're not thinking about not being able to successfully rob a bank. You know, you're not thinking, there's all these things that you're not taking into consideration because it doesn't even cross your mind. Like us having this conversation about giving up so much for so little is now with clarity of thought. But how many people have have ended up in jail for stealing a DVD player? You know what I mean? At gunpoint. Uh I inter I interviewed a I I interviewed a guy oh um episode uh you're going home it's called you're going home he did 20 years for a gram of speed there you he go. was a three striker they struck him out for a gram of speed and he served 20 years in prison there you he wasn't it. he wasn't thinking about 20 years in prison he was thinking about getting high correct correct so you have to you know in, in that in the simplest way of bringing that point home or bringing that point across is that there is no rational thinking when we are, when, when we're, when we, when the obsession of the mind kicks in, Mm. you know, the phenomenon of craving takes over, then any risk, 
any risk is worth the reward. Any risk. Any risk, any any risk. risk is worth it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's why that's and, – and for me, for in my recovery, why it was so important for me to stay with the herd, right? Because then – I'm going to meetings. I mean I, I was in a position where I could go to tons of meetings, you know, but I stayed with – I stayed in the meetings. I dove into the literature, you know, and, and, I, and like, I, like I said, I, in the beginning, I was still getting high and I didn't even get it. I was reading my basic text every night, you know, like and the big book. And I didn't realize like I'm getting stoned every morning when I wake up and eat this brownie, you know, <laughs> right? But it's, prog- it's progress, not perfection. And I kept coming back, you know, and as cliche as that is, it's one of the most profound sayings in recovery. Keep coming back. Keep yes. coming back, man. And, and lo- we'll love you until you can love yourself. And I have found that so true. And the honesty that you find in recovery is, in my opinion, unparalleled from anywhere I've ever been, including in the church. So keep coming back. Stay with the herd. Now, we've already normally I say we've, you know, hey, let's start wrapping it up, you know, and, and start asking, answering the questions for the newcomers. So, right. <laughs> and right. I've already asked you two <laughs> questions. But but one of the reasons why, because I hadn't actually jumped into the closing questions yet. Because the one I asked you was a little bit different. It wasn't so much as far as suggestions as what you would give to a newcomer. But it was more of like if they want to get... And I understand the whole idea of easy does it. That makes sense. Totally. Right. You got to like make sure. But but here's the thing. What I've learned too is if somebody is new and they get themselves to an RCO office. Right. Uh-huh. We, you know, and, we, and for those of you, RCO means recovery community organization. Right. And they can plug them in and connect them with one of the peer counselors. Right. Or one of the not counselors, you know, one of the peer specialists or one of the recovery coaches. Right. They will introduce them to the different pathways to recovery, give them an option, but also give them a, 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 a snapshot of what it would look like to be an advocate. Because you mm. don't have to have a degree. You don't have to go, you, you don't have to have a counseling degree or a therapeutic degree or, or any kind of, uh, uh, of extensive um, schooling to be an advocate and to get involved. And I think for some of us, the, the sooner we can get involved with positive advocacy work towards recovery, the more profound our experience would be. What do you think? Are you following that? Uh- I'm totally following that. I it's 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 being of service. It's not just I'm not just going here or I, I'm I'm not just it's not just for me because it's it's a selfless recovery is selfless. You know, you only keep what you have by giving it away. And so for me, the the, the whole concept of serving or or what you're saying, like having the opportunity to be an advocate in yes. some way, shape or form, that's, that's giving, right? That's like taking whatever it is that I've learned that my higher power has graced me with and sharing it with other people. And you can do it. Like, I think a lot of people feel like, especially in early recovery, like there's like, they, they see the differences. They don't, they don't see the similarities. They think there's nobody that understands me. They think I don't have anything to offer. And like what you have to offer is your life, man. Like you, you can. And so that's why I think, you know, on every NA, every NA and AA uh, meeting guide, I don't know about AA, but an NA, the meeting guide has a <laughs> list for phone numbers, right? Yes. And, and so they, they want you to take down as many phone numbers as you can, and, and they want us to use them to call people. Well, the value in that isn't just as a protection against ourselves, right? You know, I call after I haven't called my sponsor in a couple of days, I, he, I, I go, man, I'm sorry I didn't call. I'm sorry I haven't called you a couple of days. He's like, yeah, that's all right. Don't worry about me. <laughs> because i'm so selfish so self-centered it's always about me right and just fuck the next man you know what i mean and that's not it and so like you can be an advocate and so getting those numbers and getting in the practice of calling and reaching out to people in the fellowship not only is it going to be a protection for you but it's going to open the door it's a network it's a network of people and you're going to have opportunities through building those relationships with people in whichever path of recovery you decide to go down. And and trust me, and I'm sure O will back me up that your higher power is going to open the door of opportunity for you to be an advocate in some way, shape, or form. I mean, whether it's 
being a greeter, which I have, I'm a greeter at my home group. It's one of the most important jobs at any meeting, being a greeter, right? At, or go, going and advocating for whatever it is that you do, criminal justice reform, I do that too. Or, or having the opportunity to start a podcast or going and helping homeless people. Your network is going to provide you with opportunities to do that. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. I love it. All right, buddy. So let's, I mean, we've been on this call for a while, so we, we got to wind it down. We totally do, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so uh, we've already answered the suggestions. Uh, but tell us, tell us um, what was keeping you initially from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? Man, people, places, and things. Mm, yeah. Not being willing to make, make those clean breaks in, in a nutshell. Yeah, no, it's 100% true, 100% yeah. true. And tell us about that white light moment. When did you have, because I remember you, you, you had a few, right? I you, did. You definitely had a few in there. But at what point did you have that spiritual awakening, that aha moment in recovery when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but, the first, but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? You know, for the for me, the first time was that very first meeting that I was sitting in. I had I had been given the gift of desperation. Yeah. That's the that's the only reason I would even consider setting foot in any anonymous meeting, right? But when I sat in that chair, and you know, I had read the steps when I before I went to prison. When I was in county jail, I had read the steps. I had a life recovery Bible that has the steps built into it, you know, but. When I was sitting in that meeting, in that AA meeting, and I read that big ass thing of steps on the wall, like I had an aha moment. There's no question about it. Where I read those steps, you know, and 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 a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. And and you know, step two, like I can be restored to sanity, even though I feel crazy right now. Like there's a room full of people that seem pretty sane right now. And if what they're saying is true, then they're grimy addicts just like me, you know? And so there must be hope for me, you know? And, and of course for me, I have been clean before. So, but it was that moment for me, man, that very first meeting and reading those steps on that wall where I was like, Oh, but for the grace of God, you know? And I mean, I've had, I've had tons of them since then. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. So do you have any books? I think you and I are kind of similar, but I do have some books that I that I recommend. Do you have some books that you would recommend to our listeners that you read in early recovery or that you're currently reading right now? I mean, the basic text. It, That's always solid. The basic text is my go-to. I do use the just for today. And for me, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a Bible guy, you know? So every morning I read my Bible and, uh, you know, I'm reading Drop the Rock. That's a really good that's book. That's a great book. Yes. Right. So that's another one that I would recommend. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the books that I'm reading are more, are more Christian-based books, you know. But the basic text, man, and it works how – why? And the big book, man. The big book is awesome. I, I, I just feel like in early recovery, like keep it simple. Stick to the, stick to the basics, man. That's, that's me. I love it. I love it. You know what? There is another book. There is one actually. It's called, uh, especially if your drug of choice is meth. It's called. Uh, um, it's called. Uh, uh, gosh, I can't think of it right now. It's by Joseph Sharp, and it's. I think it's called Quitting Crystal Meth, actually. And it's really, really good because it talks about not only the psychological aspect of it and the mental things you're going to go through, but he, ta he talks about the biological change that happens as well and how patient you need to be because your body will undergo changes and it will take time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. All right. So we've, I know you give them the suggestions, but let's give, a, let's give our listeners a final parting piece of advice. What? If you could give our newcomers only one suggestion, what would it be? Do the steps or die, motherfucker. <laughs> yes. Yes. An, uh, that's a, the, the, an absolutely phenomenal way to close. <laughs> Do the steps or die, that's it. motherfucker. <laughs> I mean... No, no. That's that's the work, man. Hands it's recovery is not easy. If you think recovery is easy, then somebody's not telling you the truth. It's not easy, and but that's where it's at, man. That's where I've learned so much about myself and about how I treat others when I'm not treating myself the way I should and the way I deserve. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Whew. Daniel, man, brother, thank you so much for joining us. 
Man, my pleasure, Oh, It's been a blast. Absolutely, man. It has been. What a story. Woo! <laughs> Damn. From the ashes. Don't forget to check out my podcast, too, Released into Captivity. Oh, thank goodness you brought that up. All right. So please, Daniel, tell our listeners, if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to find you and your resources? ReleasedIntoCaptivity.com. You can go to shoot me a line. And uh, you can shoot me a line there or my email address is on the website. You can get a hold of me that way. We're on iTunes. We're on we're, – we're everywhere. As a matter of fact, we're going to be on Spotify in the next couple of weeks too. So, All right. Folks, we have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, pura vida. Pura vida. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step fellowship as a whole. And though we discuss 12-step recovery and the impact it had in our lives, we do not promote or endorse any 12-step anonymous program.